Section 10, Game Flow. Rule 85.1. If the puck striking the spectator netting goes unnoticed by the on-ice officials, play shall continue as normal, resulting and resulting play with the puck shall be deemed a legitimate play. We oh, that's screwed. unfortunate. Because that was a big momentum thing. Like, that was that would have been... Would that have been 2 nothing? Yeah, uh, one one. No, two, no uh, it would have been two, it would have been two 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 two. Well, that was to tie it up. Yeah, yeah, but that was just a huge swing, and I don't know. I just feel like we got screwed there. Yeah. And the goalie. And the goalie. Right, and the goalie interference. Interference, yeah. We got screwed. That's it. It's been yeah. bad officiating the entire playoffs for everybody. And baseball too. What's with officials, man? We have, they have more help than ever with all these replays, and they still suck. Did you see Marcelo Zuna the other day struck out? on three straight-looking pitches that were balls. All three of them were balls outside the zone, and he struck out looking. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, I didn't to get see that. Robots. Why would I? <laughs> they need to get rid of that stupid box where I can see yeah. that it's a ball and strike. If you're not gonna, I, I'm with you. If you're not going to implement it and use the box, Less get rid technology. of the box. Less technology. Less technology. Well, I want the technology. No, I don't. But have the... Like, I, I want, the, I want the, the strikes and balls to be called with a little buzzer. When I see it, boom, mm. ball. Bzz. Oh, Tiger just ripped one right down the middle. You guys want to press a button at home, Chris? You want to be yeah. in charge of no, all? No, I'm not saying me. I'm saying somebody in the like somebody watching a TV at the stadium, an official, mm. sees the box, boom, ball, and they buzz it down to the umpire. There can still be an umpire there. Oh, Jeremy you're, said no. Sorry. You're allowing for happen. there to be an umpire there, but you just want it to be done all electronically. Celebrity just balls umpires. And strikes. Balls and strikes. Yeah. I'm so over. Get rid of the box. Okay, if you're going to do it the way that we're doing it now, get rid of the stupid box. You said Marcelo Zuna, and my uh, my initial thought when I saw him in a big league er, uh, uniform earlier this year was just like, how the hell is he still in a big league uniform? Like, they won the championship without him. He's at home beating up his wife, is arrested, leaves the sport, and then quietly returns to the sport and is back in the middle of the lineup as Freddie Freeman leaves. And I'm like, wait a minute, shouldn't we? Like, what? Eh, what? Why is he? What? Eh, oh, th let's talk about the strike zone. Because he could still hit 25 homers, Dan. That's why. That is correct, Stugatz. I mean, Trevor yeah. Bauer can still strike people out, can he? That's right. He can. Yes, uh, you're thank, right, Roy. Actually, thank you, Roy. He can point still... counterpoint. Yes. How about that, Bells? Well, but not only point counterpoint, but point counterpoint to you and your laziest point in 20 years, <laughs> which is if you hit 25 homers, you get to play all the time unless you're Trevor Bauer and now you're banned for two years. Well, he like, can't yeah. hit 25 homers. That's true, too. So, no, I can't exactly. Do that right. Prevents Are... runs from being scored. That pesky designated hitter in the National League. Now. You guys sound so lame, though, with the lamenting of, and I know, Roy, you said all the officiating has been bad as you were talking about a nine to six hockey game, but you guys sounded so lame with the, and, and it's, and the, here's the thing you're not wrong when you say, well, that does us a lot of good that the league now says that a goal that would have tied the game at 2 2 should have been called, or not the, the league's not saying this, Chris. You're saying that they're. It's on Reddit, but it's a clip, it's like a screenshot of the rules, of, of the actual NHL rules. So, Dan, you, know. you can find whatever you want to find on Reddit. If you want that to be a goal, you'll find it on Reddit. If you want people to say it wasn't a goal, you'll find it on Reddit. You can find whatever you want anywhere you want on Reddit, okay? I don't like what's going on here. Today's a Panther game day, and we haven't moved past the, you know, the first game loss. We're just kind of stuck in there, and that is a losing way of going about game two. You need to have a short memory. You need to yep. come back and you need to be ready for game two where the game's going to be played in what will future be known as hell because we discussed that, how the how arena is going down, going down into the, you know, the, uh, yeah, the center the of the center earth. Of the earth. Hold, on. Hold on. What's happening? The mute situation. We're good. The game's going to be played in hell as we discussed because the, uh, the ice den is, yeah. is falling to, down All to right, the floor of Earth. Talk to me. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's go. Game two. Did that really do it? Because that was really bad. No, you got yeah. me back. Okay. I need to get rid of, get game one out of my mind. We're back. I wanted to ask you guys this because I believe that the national audience is tired already of Panthers hockey. We're obsessed no. with. No. Well, that's too bad. No. I think somehow, yep. and I don't know how we managed to do this, Dan. I think somehow in the regular season, people hated the Panthers talk. But the Panthers are kind of like a lovable loser type situation in the playoffs right now. And I think that people want the Panthers to do well, even Agreed. though they hated the conversation 
during the regular season. I the think, Heat are another story. They're I tired think, of No, the Heat. I think yeah. they think the Panthers uh, talk ruins our show and the Heat talk ruins our show. And our Marlins. show has been – that That does not ruin the show. They like, to Miami. they like when you get derailed by the smallest of Marlins things. Last night. I'm with Billy. I, I, think, I think the Panthers have become America's team. I do. I think America is rooting for the Panthers in large part because of us and Tim Reynolds. How about that? I mean, okay, not surprising that you would think that all because you're the greatest and the best that uh, the Panthers are now America's team. I don't uh, agree with anything you're saying, but <laughs> I do think that I want to try and get uh, Dave Sampson tells this amazing story. I don't know how long it is, Roy, or if you can find it in the computer, because the story of how he got the bus from John Henry, a bus that is a two million dollar bus. Uh, in in negotiations over the team and how he was willing to make it a deal breaker is one of the greatest stories ever told on this show. But Stugatz, when you were talking about wanting to show up at a Panther game, because all yeah. of a sudden we're all hockey experts around here in an actual bandwagon, when you were asking mm -hmm. for a bandwagon, I'm saying to myself, well, how can we do this quickly? How can we create a bandwagon quickly? We haven't right. even been able to do it by game two, so we need a game five in order to do it. But can no. we get the David Sampson, John Henry bus to be the $2 million bus that Stugatz shows up as a bandwagon at a Panthers game in the future in that swamp land that, as Billy mentioned, is uh, sinking into the market. It's been legislated into the building uh, and management rules. We all understand that soon that will be under the marsh and the, the Panthers will be playing in actual hell. Well, okay, we have a workaround for this, Dan, that we have figured out. Uh, we're not going to have a bandwagon for game two because that is tonight, unless someone has, happens to have a, a spare bandwagon that they want to lend us tonight. I, what is a bandwagon, by the way? I don't know exactly. Like a flatbed that a yeah, band is yeah. on? It's like an Old know. West type of thing, right? Wow. Is it? Like a stagecoach or something like that. Look, yeah. look up the origins of bandwagon for me. Put on the poll, please, Guillermo, at Lebetard Show. Uh, do you know what an actual bandwagon is, the origins of the phrase bandwagon? We do have a workaround, though, Dan. Uh, and you, as president of this company, I think if we get you to sign off on this, we can make it happen. So we had someone present us this opportunity for Monday's Game 4 in Tampa. They said, we have a couple tickets if you guys are interested in going. Now, we have a show on Monday, and we have a show on Tuesday. But we did a little digging around, and we found out that there is logistically a way that we can fly to Tampa after the show Monday, and we can fly back Tuesday morning and get here at 7.30 a.m., and then roll right on in after a Game 4 victory... And do Tuesday show, not miss a show, but have a presence ah. in Tampa. Now, here's where you come in as the leader of this company. You just need to say, okay, do whatever you guys want, and then boom, it can be done. Yeah, but also, and pay for it. Yeah, yeah well, that, that's really, it, yeah, yeah that, that that's really the do whatever you guys want thing is that you need to kind of sign off on it with like the company checkbook or whatever. And then I'll go across the hall and I'll tell Kristen right now, Kristen, listen, we have four tickets. It's gonna Kristen. be me. It's gonna be Chris. It's gonna be Roy. Well, Roy wants to cover it as a journalist, so he's going to have a credential. <laughs> it's going to be Stu. the press box. I got credentials for games three and four. I yeah, think. I have bad news. You're not going to come in. Well, why, for that. why yeah. isn't this happening? Because I've heard it talked about for a week. Hey, we've got a chance, four no. of us, to go up there. Is it because four of you leaving will leave us decimated no, that day to no, do no, everyone to no, do their jobs no, around here? No. No, I, t I told you, we have a workaround. We're going to be back in time, well, to, unless there's a hiccup, which sometimes well, there are with planes. So your, yeah, flight allow, your, yeah. your flight arrives we leave, at 7.30. We leave after the show on Monday. We come back Tuesday Boom. morning. We exactly. take a bandwagon it, to the game it, from the airport. Is it, right. we, it, gonna does be there? the we yeah. include Stugatz? Who are we the I don't know. Well, okay, that's another thing oh, that we need no. to figure out. Oh, because no. Stugatz what? said yes to this plan. And I'm worried, and that's part of the, the situation. I don't want to tell Kristen to book this stuff for Stugatz and then have Stug and for those wondering, who's Kristen? Kristen's here kind of assuming some of Hildy's responsibilities while Hildy's in France. So now we're all caught up. So anyway, Stugat says Why that he wants Hildy to Why is Hildy in France? What kind of business is Cons. she working Con? for us? Cons? Con? Con. Con? She's conning someone. She's there doing something. Who knows? Yeah, right. My favorite film events. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> I put it put it on the poll at Levitard Show. Should Stugatz have an annual film event known as Con C O N? 
little housekeeping here. The word bandwagon was coined in the USA in the mid 19th century simply as the name for the wagon that carried a circus band. A circus band. Wow. A circus band. That's well, us. that's perfect. Yeah. Yes. And but you're saying I don't know what a physical bandwagon looks like. And before you put it in Tampa in game four, I want to talk about this bus and this party bus that might not qualify as a bandwagon, but again, is a two million dollar bus. Play Roy real quickly, the sound of David Sampson. I believe I have the details right. And I loved when David Sampson, throughout the pandemic, went through all of his notes on Marlin's negotiations, on Marlin's transactions, and showed you the real underbelly with Mike Ryan, like he does today, of the business machine and how it works. John Henry, who parlayed Marlin's ownership into not building a stadium here, and fled and got the Red Sox and became very rich and is a man that, among other things, has no liquid in his eyes. So during tense negotiations, he's got to use an eyedropper because he doesn't cry real human tears. He's just perpetually putting into his <laughs> eyes liquid so he could be more human. He's an unusual right. man <laughs> that could be a villain billionaire, and he got the Boston Red Sox, and now he's a giant soccer owner. And at the end of negotiations over the Marlins, I believe that John Henry wanted to keep his damn bus and was willing to nuke the deal over the bus. And I believe David Sampson said, go ahead, nuke the deal. I'm keeping the bus. And so this is what happened. You know the Marlins bus? Have you ever seen the Marlins bus around town? It was John Henry's motor coach. He bought and, and from scratch, a $2 million motor coach that's like a tour bus that had couches and, and TVs and direct TV. And he would drive it back and forth from his house in Boca to pro player. And then to spring training and back, this was his bus. And a, a condition of the sale is he wanted to keep the bus. He wanted to have the bus for him in Boston. And uh, right before the deal was closing, it's my famous and favorite bus story, is I called John Henry and I said, by the way, we're taking the bus. <laughs> and he lost his mind. He hung up on me. He Did started you? swearing because I just wanted to give it. I was so annoyed with the way that Lucinda and David Ginsburg were acting that I said, you know what? I don't care. I'll, I'll walk away from this deal over this bus. John Henry at a black tie event. He was at a wedding. He walks out of the wedding. He calls me and he starts swearing at me, right? Saying, I'm telling you right now, this is my effing bus. I'm not even talking to you about this bus. The fact that you made me step out of this party about this bus, this is an outrage. I said, John, let me be very clear. Enjoy your wedding. There is no deal without the bus. <laughs> Click. <laughs> Next phone call I get is from Major League Baseball. Bob Dupay. You're going to blow up the biggest franchise swap historic. You're a part of history, David, and you're telling me over a $2 million bus, you are going to blow this transaction up. I said, Bob, I'm telling you now, no bus, no deal. David, are you being serious? Are you flexible in this in any way? I said, Bob, I will die on the bus. Two days later, John Henry gave up the bus and he really didn't talk to me much after that. And we Great. still have the bus. What do you mean you still have the bus? The team okay. still has a bus? Or nope. when, when Jeter closes, you ride that sucker out? Oh, my God, you did. It's, it's even better than that. We're selling to Jeter. Jeter is not paying attention to anything other than the fact that A-Rod is not getting the team. That's all Jeter cared about. <laughs> Literally, that was it. So there's an asset in the deal it's an asset deal, which means you're buying assets. He was buying the assets from us, from Jeffrey. And one of the assets was the bus. So how old is this bus now? It's by the way, this bus can go forever. This bus can go to a million miles. It's got 50,000 or a hundred thousand miles on it. And this bus, it is gold. I am sitting in PJ Loyello's office with Jeff Conine. PJ Loyello the is the head of communication. The guy who hates all of you guys because you do nothing but manipulate me. Yeah. He can't even listen to these local hours, right? He has like PTSD from a sweat standpoint. Yeah. So he's worried. I'm worried. So we're sitting in his office, me, Jeff, Conine, and Loyello. I said, Conine, this team is being sold, but I have a crazy idea. Let's call Jeffrey and let's buy the bus. The two of us. <laughs> so we call Jeffrey and say, hey, Jeffrey, um, we want to buy the bus from you. And Jeffrey said, well, I don't care. Does Jeter, is Jeter think he's getting the bus? I said, who cares? We're just going to take it out of the deal. Jeter won't care. He won't know the difference. Jeffrey Loria sold the bus to me and Conine for 10 grand. 10 grand. Amazing. So we, Conine and I started a company to buy the bus. It's called WGTFB LLC. 
we got the effing bus, LLC. <laughs> you know the Marlins bus? Have you do you guys want to take the bus up to Tampa for game four? Is that the oh, bandwagon? Oh, that's a good idea. Is that yeah, the bandwagon? The well, I mean, yeah. then we're definitely not going to be back in time for game five. Oh, you could? No, or, okay. We're not going to be back for Tuesday. You can? Yeah. You can what? sleep on the bus on the way back, on the drive Wait back? Wait a second. Mm. Billy, we Is take David the coming? bandwagon. We take the bandwagon bus across Alligator Alley. We dress it up as the Panther bandwagon on the outside. We're all in there on the inside partying, getting ready for the game, doing what we do. I, that would be a blast. Let's go. You're not going to do any of that. I know. For real, though, it's it's an hour on the bird. Maybe, I don't know, Skip was around here. Maybe he'll donate his PJ for this ex excursion. Then we definitely oh, won't be late. You no, know what I, I, mean? I do understand all the ways that you guys want to make this more and more expensive. And I understand that the $2 million party bus isn't quite enough for you. And the fact that you guys could Gas broadcast. Gas is really expensive. Yeah, the, it's going to yeah. cost more no, no, to I honestly drive that than fly. I understand the bandwagon I'm trying to make free isn't as great as four flights first class back and forth to Tampa. So you guys can rush back and forth and do a 14-minute post game. I We're know. doing it for you. Yeah. No, I know. Exactly, it's totally yeah. unselfish. Act yeah, right, and doing right, it for us. We'll post a couple thirty-second videos on uh -huh. Twitter yeah. beforehand. Yeah, I, Roy, you're not going for game three, by the way. I'm just, I, I, I just like to let you know that right now. Uh, you don't charge this? Not, I mean, because uh, okay. if you up. go for game three, then we can't go for game four. You know what I mean? Well, what is happening with this since you are now negotiating trips? And, and I want you guys, I want to be doing all the stuff that ESPN couldn't do. I want you guys to go to cool things so that Roy can have an experience in Washington that uh, has already been ruined because they lost game one and Mike has declared the season over. Uh, you're not going to tell me, Roy. I've, I've looked in your eyes and I've asked you if you're scared. Not before this one. Not now. And you've said, I'm just concerned. Is the most that you, <laughs> is, it's the most you. He has a look of no, concern. This one, that was the last series. That's when they came within a you know a crossbar of losing the last series to an eight seed. All he would grant me was concern. Now you've lost to the Lightning. You lost four to one at home, and this goalie of theirs it is completely unscore. You can't score on him. Nobody can score on him, no matter how great you are. And your level of concern is where I'm not scared of these fools. Get out of here, man. It's just game one, yeah. all right. It wasn't oh, wait, four bells? to one. Also, like we discussed that, it was. It wasn't really four to one because Chris was looking on Reddit to find out how it is to get goals for the Panthers. So the Panthers <laughs> scored two goals, and then you know we were watching, and we all know that that was goaltender interference. So that you then subtract a goal away from Tampa Bay, and then that's basically like three, a th two. three three game, I think, by my math. Yeah. And then you have all the momentum. You have the home crowd. You have everybody on the pan wagon there. I mean, that's a, that's a whole different series. Exactly. You know what I mean? Game four, when we would be going there for this game, me, Chris, Dugats, K-Funk, and uh, Roy and Lewis, I guess, would be recording for him. I don't know who would be recording for Stugat. You don't want to go? What? Why not? You're tired? What is that? You went to Washington. Danny, you coming? Please who's stop coming? talking to the person who doesn't have a microphone, Billy. He loves doing that. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't, I mean, yeah, to but, but is it okay? You're logistics. not trying to figure anything yeah. out. You're just trying to roll <laughs> more chaos across the floor. Can you guys, I, I really do want to figure out if you guys understand how silly and awful you sound when you're like, I saw on Reddit that we could have made it 2-2 fairly and instead we just lost 4-1 at home because we're assholes. Oh. Like we're we're searching on oh. Reddit for the way that Stop. we can find where we're wrong Why? when we lost 4-1 at home. Right, let's not focus on Reddit. Yeah. Just because this was yeah. discovered on Reddit doesn't mean that the, 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 the screenshot I saw was of the actual NHL rules screenshot. saying that that play should have been, it should have been a play on. Do you realize, my point is that in any other sporting event played anywhere, if a sports fan uh, lamented in a 4-1 loss, and what about that goal that would have changed momentum? What you can be saying is true. Nobody on earth gives a flying bleep about that. Like you, oh, the almost, a 4-1, to one. get the bleep out of here. You're the best team in the league and you were at home. Almost, almost, That's with, fair. almost on Reddit. I was almost on Reddit and I almost won the game. Like I, you, you'd laugh at any other sports fan that brought that limp shit in here. Not if it was a legitimate yeah. point. If, yeah. it, if, if I saw on Reddit that it was a legitimate 
Miss call. I'm just pointing out it was a miss call. I'm yeah, with you. Geez. It's not a good look. Let's move forward. I'm confident we still got this. It's going to be a long series. Where are you going to be tonight? Are you going to be at Panthers hammered hockey? Where I'll be oh. at the ha- yes at the Panthers game. Okay, so you're going to do a hammered the, the Chris did. Cody hammered post game right. report. To this That's right. Yeah. The best kinds. Wait, so you're going to be hammered at the Panthers game while Roy is taking intermission too seriously. That's right. Are you? Roy goes down for you this guys post- are an Can we odd- talk about this, you and are your Are you guys together for this, Why? or you're going with tickets? Well, I go with tickets, and then I walk up to the, and me and him record uh, after the game. But you guys are a real odd couple, because again, Roy's Roy's tweets on hockey are strange, in that it's just like, strange. okay, here comes a four-on-four. Four. Dan, I sat with Roy in the press box for a Panther game, okay? I'm 1-0 when I go to Panther games, by the way. I know the Panthers want me Are you tonight. going tonight? How- are you going I'll, tonight? I'll, I'll see how I feel later, okay? I'm a little bit under the weather. So no. It's very cold. So it's very no. cold in that arena, even though it's sinking into hell. Uh, I will tell you that Roy takes his hockey very, very, very seriously. seriously. And he takes that job very seriously. Roy is not there wasting your money, Dan. Roy is That's watching right. the game. Well, Roy's Roy there is for collecting Roy. sound. Roy is going to the post game press conference. Nary a sound Roy Roy's collected is has been played. I think you're right about that. I want to know why he goes to the post game press yeah, conference. He makes me wait I, 20 weird. minutes. I'm sitting up there. I go up yeah. right after the game. I'm like, all right, let's record this because thing. Because he loves every morsel of it. He just wants it. to hear it. He loves more. Th- he loves this more than you do. He cares about this more than you do. Yep. It's why he is ri- he's risen up to a level of concern. In his fandom. He is not scared, but he's risen to a level of concern. Well, here's the thing, though, Roy. If you're going to be an impartial member of the media as you're presenting yourself, you can't care. You need to not care about the outcome. You need to just be there to report the facts as they happen, not your opinion. There's no, you know, there's no Roy's thoughts on this. It's just what's going on. So are we going as a member of the impartial media or are we going as Roy? I can give my opinion on no. the play that happened. Yes. No. The, what are you talking about? The more Craig, I cover games, everyone in the media is just a fan. It's crazy. Yeah. I'm learning that more and more. Pretending as to be objective? Yes. Yeah. Well, the... Yeah. the, the like, I, I always thought my dad was like, oh, all these other journalists are down the middle. My dad, he's a little bit of a homer. They're all... Everyone's a homer. Yeah. But the, wall, the walls in recent years, we were all pretending better, and then Wilbon started wearing Blackhawks jerseys on the air on PTI, and we're like, okay, we don't have to do this anymore. I think that's how that happened. Where it Wilbon, was the Cubs World Series, Dan. He was my, wearing Cubs hat. Yeah, that's Cubs what all Yeah, he yeah he tucked all. in, yeah. yeah. yeah Wilbon yeah. decided that for all of us. He, he tucked in his Cubs jersey <laughs> and threw out a first pitch, and we're like, okay, we're all allowed to take off these disguises of objectivity and pretend. We don't have to pretend anymore. But, Chris, I'm with you. I want to follow you down this path because, I uh, the Roy creature, creature at the arena. Yes, no, Roy. The Roy hockey creature who is covering the game as a media member is indeed a creature. This is an, a uniquely uh, studied specimen in the wild that I would love to eat, see watch eat free potato chips and wander around and take hockey very seriously, more so than just about anyone in there. Like Goldstein will have a crack at a smile or something. You are in there brooding and studying and and – and being very serious during intermission. Do I have any of and this? eating hot dogs. Do I have any of what I'm saying wrong? Yes, he will allow himself the gluttony of all the free food, and that is where he will put down his objectivity and his serious coverage to eat a delicious free hot dog with chips, <laughs> or seven of them. I can't disagree, no. <laughs> <laughs> Big fan of this man's work. Been wanting to talk to him for a long time, and now he's doing George Carlin's American Dream. It's going to be on HBO, Back to Back Nights. Part one debuts Friday, 8 p.m. Part two, Saturday, a comedic hero. Uh, Judd Apatow followed in the footsteps of people like this through this very small comedy world of stand-up comics and everyone else. And uh, one of the reasons I want to talk to you, Judd, and thank you for joining us beyond George Carlin, is I thought that you did such an artful job uh, with Gary Shandling's story and so touching and moving the way that you told that in documentary form. And I, I admire that what you're choosing to do here with uh, the platform that you've been given, which could be anything, is to honor some of the people who made comedy great for you and for others. Well, yeah, I'm a bit of a hoarder, you know, so the idea of organizing someone's life and all the things they did and trying to come up with a presentation for people is something that, I really like to do because it makes me sad to think someone was hysterical somewhere and it'll just go down a digital black hole and you'll never hear 
about it again. And I feel like these people, they have such amazing stories, but if they're not presented well to the next generation, they'll never know that George Carlin existed. They'll never figure out what that journey was and how important his work was. So it, it's really fun for me. And, uh, and he was the best. I mean, he predicted everything. He warned about everything. And the reason why he's always trending on t- Twitter is anytime something happens, he had the best routine about it. Are you trying to honor your craft through him when you say something like that, that people deserve to know what came before them? People deserve to do the, to know the history of who, who shaped comedy, who the leaders and the pioneers were. Yeah. I mean, these are, you know, these are the people that broke down all the walls. I mean, George Carlin would get arrested after a show. He did the seven words you can't say on television uh, in Wisconsin. And then, when the show was over, he went to jail. <laughs> you know, so hmm. the, they're they're the people that uh, made everything that we see now possible. But he's still also the funniest. I mean, he's on our Mount Rushmore, and and his life is very interesting. He he, you know, he's a New Yorker. His mom had to divorce his father uh, in 1938 because he was beating up his older brother who was like six, and move upstate, and then finally moved back to to New York and he went to Catholic school and just doubted everything and became a lifelong, you know, critical thinker. He, he, he was always thinking we need to really look at things. We shouldn't trust everything. And uh, so we all talk about that. Now everybody feels like, I don't know if everything is really what they say it is. And he was warning people about that for decades. Judd, what amazed me about Carlin was he seemed to get better with age. Uh, besides the delivery, besides how quick he was, he seemed to be very good as he got older. In fact, better uh, than when he was younger. From your perspective, knowing how hard it is to do what he did, uh, what made him so great at this? You know, he was obsessed with language and words. He, he also always wanted to be like Danny Kay. Like he 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 was a DJ and and so he had the voice and he you know he really was performing something that he had written very carefully, but you know he was a big ideas guy. You know he was doing routines that were about the hypocrisy in the world and really carefully showing you. Uh, I mean, there's this, this bit he does about hell. Like he hated the idea of hell. He's like, so there's ten rules. And if you don't follow them, you burn in hell and God sends you to hell to suffer till the end of time. But he loves you and he needs money. <laughs> no, his, his stuff his stuff on church uh, was wonderful and it was groundbreaking beyond uh, George Carlin. And again, George Carlin's American dream, I'm sure it's going to be great because Judd doesn't do anything that's not uh, – it's not careful, but I'd like to comb through some of your history making the movies. And before we do yeah. this, um, I, I just want to ask you, how tired in general are you of this? And what are some of the things I need to avoid? Because you're very passionate about promoting this stuff. You get around and I don't know where and how you're tired of your own voice on some of the George Carlin stuff. So I don't want to ask you. <laughs> and it, like, I imagine you're very tired right now because you've been doing a lot of this. Well, I, you know, I love talking about him. I'm, it's, I'm, it's an honor that I got to even mess around in his sandbox and, and, and play around. And I, you know, I've also been promoting this book, Sicker in the Head, where I interviewed a lot of the comedians from now, like Sasha Baron Cohen and, and you know, Amber Ruffin and Rami Youssef and all these people like uh, Nathan Fielder. I'm always obsessed with comedians like because I'm, I'm a fan. I just want to go, how do you do it? And also in life, how do you not lose your mind? Like, you know, people people are all so stressed. We're all trying to figure out how to evolve and not be crazy. And so I, I really can't get enough of, of just the world of comedians and why they do it and if they can stay sane and do good work over a long period of time. George Carlin, he was great for 50 years. You know, a lot of people, they get, you know, they do the same act their whole life or they run out of gas or they don't have any new moves. So when you find somebody who just keeps reinventing themselves like the Beatles, you know, like Cobert in the doc says, you know, he started out doing love me do. And he did end doing, you know, the white album doing Helter Skelter. I'm familiar with what it is you're saying, the new act stuff, you know, staying relevant. I'm still making the same jokes I've made for 20 years. Anyway, I want that Mount Rushmore Judd filled out. You said George Carlin was on your Mount Rushmore. Can you fill that out for us? Well, I mean, I like so many people, it's hard to name, but obviously Richard Pryor is the one that I, you know, put up there. You know, I think about the older people. There's so many great people now, it's hard to 
you know, to judge them. But I always go to like Steve Martin and Richard Pryor because I don't know if many people have reached those, you know, those peaks comedically. I love Maria Bamford. Obviously, we all love Chris Rock and Chappelle and Bill Burr. Uh, I mean, there's so many people that are amazing right now. Uh, it's a pretty incredible time. I mean, Adam Sandler doing stand up and doing his music always made me deliriously happy. But there, there really are so many people. And Shandling, Shandling was one of the greatest. I, I love though that you're still fascinated by the world where funny comes from because it's such a strange, weird, insular world. There's so few of you, Judd. Like you all seem to know each other. The people who come, uh, all of you seem to be friends. The people who are on Anchorman uh, yeah. or or the Ballad of Ricky Bobby or in the comedy clubs, uh, being raised in L.A. near the comedy store. It seems like you all know each other. Well, I think it's like any other business that you just you, you travel in a similar circle. And I think with comedians, because every joke is an experiment and all of us never know if we're going to bomb. We, we certainly empathize with the struggle to stay funny or to even know if the next joke or the next movie is good. And probably we all have similar mental problems that make us relate to each other in, in some way. You don't have real and extraordinary confidence as soon as you set out to make a movie? No, because I think everything is, a, it really is an experiment. Like one movie working doesn't mean the next one will work. So when you think of anybody you love or any director, you, you go, you know, if they made 10 movies and three or four are great. It's pretty shocking. It's a high ratio. Uh, you know, they're all just swings and you just don't know when you're going to whiff and you have to have the courage to just go for it again. Like when you see a basketball player and at the end of the game, he wants the ball and he wants to try. I think that it's the same in comedy. Like give me the ball, but I know I'm going to miss it half the time, but I got to, you know, I got to try. Well, your, your resume is extraordinary. So take me through this because you can never know really what's going to hit. Give me the movie yeah. on your resume that you thought when you sent it out the door, this is amazing. People are going to love this. This is a home run. And then somehow ended up being a disappointment because it didn't meet your, you know, whatever it is you thought wasn't the same as what, uh, you know, the world thought. Well, sometimes, you know, you like it, but you get a smaller crowd that's really rabidly into it. You know, I loved uh, Walk Hard uh, was a movie I co-wrote with Jay Kazan, which he directed, which, you know, I think has lived on to be a real cult film and people really like it but it opened up to like 2.9 million dollars i mean it was it, it it really whiffed at the it was so good you know, though and 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 here's the thing though i didn't get it the first time i actually walked out the first time it took me a minute to appreciate it like i i it really did uh walk hard was great not good great yeah it's a specific joke you know it's not like the world was demanding a parody of Ray and Walk the Line, but it just so made us laugh. And then when movies like the Queen movie came out, people noticed that the structure of all these music biopics are the same. And the thing that we were goofing on, uh, it, unfortunately, is something you almost can't avoid when you make a movie where you try to compress a life into 90 minutes, that it has to get weird. How about the other way where you made a movie, you thought it sucked, okay, but we all loved it. Or you didn't, you just didn't have confidence. You're like, ooh, I'm not sure about this. Well, sometimes you just don't know what will explode. I mean, I think by the end of the process, we usually like the movie a lot. So there's never one that we think, oh, we don't like it. It's just will people go to it? And so, you know, when something like, you know, like when Knocked Up came out, like we loved it. But it was, you know, a movie with the lead was Seth Rogen and Catherine Heigl was on a TV show and Grey's Anatomy. And it wasn't like a mega star movie. And then it just was giant all around the world. And I remember seeing people of every type in line at the Grove in L.A. The line was so long. And you just go, I don't it, I don't understand how it just connected, like something about those people and that idea. Bridesmaids was like that, where. We liked it, but we didn't know if people would go, and then it became... You never you know, know though, Judd? You never know where you're sending it out the door, and you're like, this is absolutely funny, and this will succeed. That's not... I mean, you don't know with 40-Year-Old Virgin. You don't know it with uh, Superbad. You don't know it with Anchorman. You don't know it with Talladega Nights. You don't know it with Forgetting Sarah Marshall. 
Okay, you know it. Okay, I guess you, know. <laughs> you just proved me wrong. Yeah. You're being <laughs> yeah, but humble. sometimes, you know, sometimes something really makes you laugh and and you think, uh, you know, this will be like in like a giant movie. And some of those, you know, some of those movies did good, but not great. You know, they did like, okay. And we think they're just as good as the ones that did, you know, a, a ton. But it, 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 I mean, it really doesn't matter because everyone watches everything sooner or later. Like there's no movie that doesn't get seen. Like you saw Walk Hard, you didn't like it and you still watched it again and then liked it. Like people get around to finding Walk Hard. And so between streaming and everything, as long as we like it, that's all that really matters because eventually people get so bored, they watch everything. Can you walk us through on, if I ask you some rapid fire questions, just sort of stream of thought, because you really are a good analyst of these people and how they make comedy. So when I asked Judd Apatow in his life among these comedians, the one most likely that if you pick up the phone, you're going to laugh. You're going to laugh the most because when that person calls you, uh, it's going to be funniest. Who from your world does that distinction belong to? Who actually makes you laugh? Like when you just chat with them. I mean, kind of Kevin Hart does. I mean, he really is funny as hell. Like when you talk to him, you're like, oh yeah, this is why everyone in the world loves him because just even like chatting at the comedy cellar, he's riotously funny. And Bill Burr is like that too. If he wants to be funny with you, you know, he's riotous. But that, that seems like that might be a handful, though, too, if it's calling you. And sometimes you might want to let it go to voicemail because it's a lot. <laughs> well, oh, they don't call again. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's angry and he's uh, he's spitting bile. Um, which of your movies would you say has the most ad lib in it? Uh, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, well, the movie we just did, The Bubble, we did an enormous amount of improv. You know, it's our Netflix movie about, like, all the actors in the hotel during the pandemic trying to make a dinosaur action movie. And, you know, we, in the middle of the pandemic, we were like, let's be the people who tried to make a comedy about this. No one else seems to have the courage to do it. And so we had Keegan Michael Key there, who was pretty incredible. I mean, really one of the great improvisers of all time. And Karen Gillan, you know, from Jumanji and Leslie was in it. And, uh, and also like the Anchorman movies are pretty heavily, improvise but also adam mckay and will ferrell feed them incredible lines as they're talking uh you know a lot of those moments like i am in a glass case of emotion you know milk was a bad choice like those are things that that occurred in in the moment can you give us some of the nasty details of the letter you wrote to steve martin after he did not give you an autograph well it's so funny because as a kid, you just don't understand, like, you shouldn't walk up to people's homes. <laughs> you know, like, the, like, you guys don't want, like, strangers, you know, listening to the show, just walking up to your house. And But I didn't know that at 13, so I just saw him outside his house and walked up to him and asked him for his autograph. And rightly, he said, no, because I don't do that at my house. And so I sent him a letter and said, if he didn't send me an apology, I was going to send his address to Homes of the Stars. And he would have tour buses passing by twenty cars. You threat, so you're threat, boy. You're actively threatening Steve Martin yeah. now for not giving you an autograph. But then he sent me a book, and it said, you know, he wrote in it, "To Judd, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was speaking to the Judd Apatow." And the funny thing about that—that's so crazy. That was 42 years ago. I'm old as shit. We all are. The the Judd Apatow. Uh, who would you say? Because you mentioned Sasha Baron Cohen, and if I just say genius to you, just yeah. ge- just genius, like what word association? Where are you going there? I mean, Sasha's right up there. It has the most courage of anyone because I think what he does is actually dangerous. Like he shoots some days, and at the end of the day, people are searching for him. Like people want to hurt him in a very real way, and I think he's also brilliant about the point of those bits and what he's trying to say about people and human nature. So yeah, he's certainly one of them. George Carlin's American dream will debut on HBO on back to back nights. Part one debuts Friday, May 20th. That's this Friday, 8 PM part two Saturday. I could talk to this guy for a long time. Both episodes will be available on HBO max 
uh, beginning Friday. The last, uh, the last thing before I get you out of here, though, uh, how much uh, bad ended up on your forehead because of how you cl- uh, clutched the pearls on Will Smith slapping Chris Rock and and and, 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 and saying he could have died there, and, and 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 then there were sanctions, and the Academy takes itself very seriously, and now Judd Avatow is the scared face of. Uh, you know what's so? You know what's so funny is that like, first of all, I stand by it. Anytime a very large man smashes someone in the face, you don't know what's going to happen. So obviously that didn't happen. But also, what if Chris, like, hit him back? Like, what could that have turned into? Right? So uh, obviously he's my friend. And, I, you know, I was very upset that anybody would hit my friend. Certainly over, like, a soft joke certainly felt inappropriate and, and has led to other people who are unhinged losing control around comedians. It's a very scary thing. And it sends a signal to drunk people or unbalanced people that you could hit people. So I, I, I stand by being very concerned about it. And uh, I, I, I certainly hope we don't see more of it, but it, I, I can't say that we won't. Oh, but you're making a link between that and and what happened with Chappelle on stage or? Yeah, I, I think as soon as like, you know, unstable people see behavior on some level, they think, oh, we're allowed to do this now. And I, I do think it, 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 it's a weird, like, dog whistle to people who are not, you know, mentally all there. Judd, I hope we can do it again. I urge everybody to watch it. I'm sure that if he made it, it is good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. Take care. Be well. Thank you, Judd. See ya.